We are very privileged to have with us tonight the former president of the Soviet Union, Mikhail Gorbachev, who is recognized as one of the foremost statesmen and leaders toward global peace in the 20th century. And President Gorbachev continues through different avenues uh, of which we will hear of some tonight to have exceptional impact on the world in the new century, the 21st century. He was president of the Soviet Union from 1985 through 1991 and instituted sweeping reforms that streamlined and decentralized the governmental system in that country. He oversaw two broad disarmament pacts and the end to communist rule in Eastern Europe. He also taught us the meaning of the words perestroika for government restructuring and glasnost for political openness. He did this by making then, by making both of those words more than words and the successful agents of social and political change in his country. For these and many other contributions, he was awarded the 1990 Nobel Prize for Peace. Since leaving political office, President Gorbachev has devoted his efforts to organizations concerned with global issues, including Green Cross International and its United States counterpart, Global Green. These are groups that assist people who are affected by environmental consequences of wars and other violence. And he is also president of the Gorbachev Foundation. We are very pleased that President Gorbachev accepted our invitation to come to the University of California, Irvine, and to be the first recipient of the UC Irvine Citizen Peace Building Award. There is great admiration throughout the world for his realistic approach to achieving peace and disarmament. He is working to spread the message of a secure, sustainable environment for all of us as humans who must do what we can to safeguard the earth and its life-supporting systems for future generations. The UC Irvine Citizen Peace Building Program is an example of using research, education, and public discussion as constructive ways to address the growing problems of conflict and violence, whether it's around the world or in our own Southern California neighborhoods. <clears throat> there are many correlations and overlaps between the goals of UCI's peace building program and the work that President Gorbachev is doing. And we hope that this historic event this evening will bring those connections into clearer focus and strength. It's an additional honor for us tonight to welcome President Gorbachev's daughter, Irina, to UC Irvine. She works as Vice President of the Gorbachev Foundation, and she also heads up the Raisa Gorbachev Club, which performs charitable activities, mainly for needy children in Russia. We are very glad for the opportunity to host her as well. Now, please join me in welcoming President Gorbachev, who will give us his views about the road to a sustainable environment and a safer world. Please welcome President Mikhail Gorbachev. Thank you for the invitation. Uh, and also for asking me to speak on an important subject. This is a good subject, an important subject, but every point that one wants to make requires at least the half hour that you have given me for the entire speech. And so I will try to be brief and you will be able to ask questions if you want me to elaborate on some of those points. My friend Federica Mayor, the former director general of UNESCO, said that uh, there was a diplomat in UNESCO representing an African country. And uh, when uh, we asked him to be brief, he came out to speak and said, thank you very much. Thank you very much. <laughs> when he was asked to speak a little more extensively, a big speech, then his speech was, thank you very much. 
First time, thank you, and then a longer speech, thank you very much. Don't expect me to be that brief, it'll be longer. So, sustainable development, a safe world. I first wanted to say, based on my knowledge and based on the evaluations and estimations of scientists, that perhaps the most important, the most significant point is that we are living in a world that is changing more and more rapidly. The pace of change is creating a tremendous stress, a tremendous pressure on society, on politics, on the emotions, on the mind of the human beings. We are not robots. We perceive everything that is happening around us. And the world that is changing so rapidly is creating a tremendous pressure and stress on us and on our environment. It is now very clear that there is a lag between these processes, rapid processes, and our readiness to live in a global and rapidly changing world. The policymakers are lagging behind the events, and that's why we are unhappy with politics and the politicians. The intellectual leaders and the intellectual centers are also behind the times, lagging behind the pace of change, and that is why there is so much concern and alarm in the world. I see that in various countries that I visit, and I spend about half in any given year traveling abroad and going to various conferences, seminars, and discussions. So I see that concern. The world really is concerned and alarmed, and people are asking what is in store for us. What does the future hold in store? The predominant characteristic of the world today is globalization. Globalization that, particularly in the final decades of the 20th century, became a very important factor and still is. After the end of the Cold War, this process has become unprecedented in its rapidity and also in being totally blind and uncontrolled. And as a result, the hopes of the international community that the resources released after the end of the Cold War could be used to address the problems, the problems that have made um, our world such a difficult place, such a problematic place. Those hopes have not been fulfilled. Even though the resources that have been uh, released uh, were quite considerable and could have made uh, the lives of many people in the world much better, the advantages of globalization, which has been mostly a spontaneous process, those advantages have mostly gone to those who had better starting conditions, that is to say, the more advanced countries. And as a result, what we wanted to do, that is to say, to implement major programs to fight poverty and backwardness, to narrow the gap between the rich and the poor, those programs have not been implemented, and uh, the gap between the rich and the poor countries, and also between the rich and the poor, even in the rich countries, that gap has grown. Another important characteristic, the third characteristic of the world today, is that 
Again, as a result of globalization, is the interdependence and interconnectedness of the world. The world has become more sensitive to what is happening anywhere in the world, in different parts of the world. We see that in the sphere of the economy and finance, in the environment, and also in the phenomenon of international terrorism that has become an international, a global problem. And uh, certainly I have to say that uh, we see this also in the sphere of information and telecommunications. So the world today contains both problems that we inherited from the past and the new problems. Summarizing those problems, one can say that the world of the 21st century is facing three main challenges. The challenge of security, including the problem of the weapons of mass destruction and its proliferation and the problem of terrorism, which has become, as I said, a global problem. It is secondly the challenge of poverty and backwardness against the background of the fact that the developed world, that is to say 20% of the population of the world today consumes 80% of the world's resources and also the degradation of the environment has now become a global problem, a global threat. And this against the background of the fact that only one-third of the population of the world lives in decent conditions, in conditions worthy of a human being, while all the others survive on one or two dollars a day. So this is the global world in which we live. And we are learning to live in this world. I cannot say that we are learning well. We have wasted a lot of time. We have not taken, have not used the opportunities opened up by the end of the Cold War. So how do we address those challenges? Take the challenge of security. The problems of security are real. But should we address those problems by means of rejecting international law, rejecting the United Nations, rejecting the UN Security Council, by acting unilaterally instead of dialogue and cooperation? By supplanting preventive diplomacy with preemptive strikes. The ideologues of this approach and some politicians are proposing the slogan of a new empire, an American empire. It seems that this slogan has been rejected by most people. People indeed show their surprise that this is being proposed now that we have not yet dealt with the consequences of the existence of the previous empires, the previous colonial empires, now a new empire. When I attended the anniversary, the 75th anniversary of Time magazine. I was one of the keynote speakers. I spoke um, last but one, and after me, President Clinton spoke, and I heard something that he said that uh, affected me, and uh, I was not indifferent to what he said. What did Bill Clinton said? By the way, we are uh, currently in contact, we meet and we discuss things, etc., etc. But what did he say on that occasion? He said the 20th century became an American century. With God's help, let us make the 21st century another American century. I asked then, what about all the others? What remains for Russia, China, India, Europe, and others? 
I was amazed that this was being proposed. And I responded with an article that I sent to Time magazine. And uh, that article was called Rethinking John Kennedy. I recalled John Kennedy's speech that was made a few months before his assassination. That speech is um, something that many people remember. At American University in Washington, he said, those who think that the peace of the future will be a Pax Americana are mistaken. Either it's going to be a peace for all, or there will be no peace at all. I think that that is indeed a prophetic phrase. No country, no group of countries can impose on the world its diktat, an attempt to dominate the world, an attempt to create a new empire, maybe conceived as a good empire, is similar to the claim of communists, to the pretension of communists to make the world happy through a communist revolution. It seems that we are not learning from the mistakes of ourselves or from the mistakes of, of others. It seems almost like been there, done that. I think that the crisis of ideas, the crisis of evaluations, the crisis of predictions, of scenarios, this is something that we have seen particularly during the Iraqi crisis. I characterized the military action against Iraq that was started without the mandate from the United Nations and against the will of the overwhelming majority of the international community as a big mistake, and that is what I still believe. The proponents of military action said that as a result of it, not only the dangerous dictatorial regime would be toppled, and that indeed happened, but that there would be a radical change for the better throughout the Middle East. It turned out that this analysis was erroneous. I said at that time, based on many years of experience in international affairs and international conflict, and also in the study of uh, the processes in the world, I said at that time the following. It is very obvious that America will defeat Iraq. There is absolutely no doubt that it will. It would be very strange if a country that concentrates 50 percent of the world's military power were not able militarily to deal with um, a backward country that was being militarily blockaded and economically blockaded, that's clear. But what will be the consequences, I asked. What comes next? There was no answer and there is still no answer. It seems that now the way to go is to find a way to rid the country of occupation because the Iraqi people do not accept occupation. Also, how to enable the soldiers who are there, and many of whom die practically every day, how to enable them to return. We, of course, were hoping, or the proponents of this military action were hoping that uh, this military invasion 
will fundamentally change Болезни, the equation in the Middle East and will particularly help to fight terrorism, this dangerous disease, this dangerous scourge of the world. Instead, we see that there is more terrorism and that the problem has become even more grave everywhere. I welcome the fact that currently the U.S. administration and other countries intend to move more rapidly to make this uh, situation better by means of adopting the constitution, by means of creating a sovereign government in Iraq to make sure that the Iraqis govern their country themselves and solve their own problems. I want this process to succeed. I want this process to move faster. I believe that um, any person who is clear-headed thinks that no one wants this uh, situation to become even more severe and for the situation to become even more dangerous. Let me add to this. If we didn't achieve what the said uh, the military planners, when they began this um, action, uh, of course, uh, had certain things in mind. But let us see what actually happened. What happened is that a lot of harm has been done to international law. A lot of harm has been done to relations between major powers. Although I must say that even during this difficult period, even during this crisis in international relations, major powers were able to maintain dialogue. And even though that dialogue was sometimes rather sharp, it continued, and that's important. And that's why it is possible now to continue the discussion, even though the approach to the problem the approaches to this problem are still different. But again, this was a major blow and a lot of harm to international relations. It was uh, a big and very damaging blow. People are now wondering if the only remaining superpower wants to engage in preemptive strikes and to do that on the basis of unilateral decisions, then this could affect any country. And uh, this has given an impetus to the arms race. And um, some may want to develop absolute weapons. And uh, I am not surprised that uh, the head of the International Atomic Energy Agency has recently said that the world is more dangerous, that the world is closer to the possibility of a nuclear conflict than before. Is this what we wanted? The situation has become more rather than less dangerous. And as a result of all this, it has become more difficult to find responses to the other challenges, global challenges that I have mentioned. Those challenges are interconnected. They cannot be wished away. They cannot be deferred. They are all interconnected very, very closely. If we address the problem of overcoming poverty and backwardness based on the traditional, outdated approach, that is to say by consuming more and more resources, by uh, actually making society even more consumerist, and by making even the rest of the world more consumerist, we could destroy the environment, totally destroy the environment. And even today, the human pressure on the environment is at a critical level. Without characterizing the problem, let me give you a few numbers. In the beginning of the 20th century, 
1,6 миллиона населения. The of the world was 1.6 billion people. Toward the end of the 20th century, the world had more than 6 billion people. In the beginning of the 20th century, the domestic, the gross domestic product in the world was 90 billion dollars. Now, toward the end of the 20th century, this amount of GDP was produced in one day. That is to say, the uh, production grew 365 times. And that means tremendous pressure on nature. In the beginning of the 20th century, we consumed 300 cubic kilometers of water. At the end of the century, we consumed 4,000 cubic kilometers of water. So those are the parameters of the problem. And that is the kind of pressure that we are exerting on nature and we feel how the environment is being destroyed. The symptoms of this overload are everywhere in the process of climate change, global warming, in the deficit of fresh water in many parts of the world, in desertification, and in the pollution of the oceans. This has truly become a global problem. A person who has dedicated his life to problems of security, of nuclear weapons, of nuclear non-proliferation, Hans Blix, a person who is probably well known to you, has uh, recently said something that sounded rather paradoxical. Actually, I was even surprised to hear this from this person who spent his life on military issues. He said that he was more concerned now not by the problems of war and peace, but by the problems of the environment, and particularly by global warming. There are also expert opinion uh, by people who are close, by scientists who are close to the U.S. administration. One of uh, your professors uh, here, a Nobel uh, Prize winner in chemistry has given me a scientific report, a report that's not political, a scientific report which uh, I believe is also very important because it contains the science on this issue. So the other report uh, that I have mentioned here that was submitted to the administration and that has recently been leaked to the media says that the uh, climate processes that are developing now within the next 20 years, within the next 20 years, will lead to major floods, to the humanitarian disasters on a global scale, and inevitably, inevitably, they could result in military conflicts. The uh, authors of that report give the following scenario as a result of environmental catastrophes, the reserves of energy, food, and fresh water will shrink so much that the governments of many countries could use the weapons of mass destruction in order to protect those resources. So this is how all of these challenges interconnect. The challenge of security, the challenge of the environment, the challenge of poverty and backwardness. So I tried to outline rather briefly the urgency of these uh, challenges and also the connection between them. In order to respond to those challenges in order to implement the necessary decisions, we should give 
some kind of governance to the world. And I'm speaking of global governance rather than of world government. Certainly, world government is not our goal. It's a utopian objective, and we should not waste our time on it. But the fact that we do need governance, that very often we uh, see just a blind, spontaneous process. That is a fact, and it is governance, precisely this kind of governance that is lacking in the world today. Let me illustrate this again by uh, environmental problems. The international community took some very important decisions at the Earth Summit in Rio and at the Johannesburg Summit, but they're not working, and not much is changing. And after all, these summits were the highest authorities, because those were the meetings of the top leaders of nations. And it appears that those decisions are just a dead letter. There is the Kyoto Protocol on reducing atmospheric pollution. That protocol, by the way, calls for the just 5% reductions in those emissions, even though scientists believe that those emissions should be reduced by 25%. But even the Kyoto Protocol still has not entered into force. And the greatest responsibility for that fact is borne by the United States of America and Russia. There have been three international conferences on fresh water. I recently participated in the latest such conference in Kyoto, Japan. Those are very competent conferences with... Um, outstanding experts participating and uh, during those conferences realistic steps were proposed to address the problem of fresh water which is the number one deficit in the world today but again significant progress on this issue has not been made in practical terms so, if this is the way these problems are handled, if these problems are not solved, then what kind of governance do we have? We just have what I call a blind process. So, what should be done? I believe that, first of all, the most important thing is to really sound the alarm. And I would like here to use a word that I've used in the past, and that is we need new glasnost, international glasnost. Citizens should insist on full information about the state of the environment. They should insist on the adoption of necessary decisions and their implementation. And this is the view of Green Cross International, an organization that has been working for over 10 years now, an organization that has um, members in 29 countries where there are national branches of uh, this organization, and currently China and India are approaching membership in this organization. So based on this understanding of the importance of Glasnost, uh, Green Cross International has founded an international environmental magazine with a symbolic name, a name that reflects our position. It's called The Optimist. The first issue of this magazine will be out very soon. It is an interesting journal, and it reflects the views of outstanding world leaders on important problems of the environment and uh, politics and security. I believe that it is only if the people, the public, 
of all countries is active, only if civil society organizations are active, there will be political will. The political will that is necessary to solve any big problem. And let me recall my own experience the experience that um, um, the experience of change that happened due to the efforts of people including me. This is when we had real political will. This is when we had real cooperation among nations that was in mid-1980s. And as a result of that change, despite the fact that at one point it seemed that we are moving toward a nuclear catastrophe, that there was no way to stop the arms race, we were able to stop that process. We were able to put an end to the Cold War, to start the process of uh, eliminating nuclear weapons. So this was done through joint efforts, and it was a big turn. What does that mean? I am convinced that history is not preordained. And this is why I am saying this. There are some scholars, or some scholars, even well-known people who are saying that the process of history is a kind of flow that cannot be changed, and whatever is happening, you cannot stop it. Well, history indeed is a flow that you cannot stop, but you should try to understand the trends, the tendencies that characterize our time and that will affect the future. It is possible to understand those tendencies and it is possible to take steps that stimulate the positive side and constrain the negative side of this process. One should try to understand what one can do, what one, one's role is in this process of history. Again, history is not preordained. There is always time for choice in history, for alternative decisions, and for initiative in history. And this historic initiative perhaps is particularly necessary now in order to work together and through a joint effort to create a new democratic world order. What that world order is going to be, no one can describe in detail, but the outlines of that world order are already clear. It has to be, it must be, more stable, more just, and more humane. I have just quoted the words of Pope John Paul II. However difficult the problems that we are facing, we must be convinced, we must be confident that the problems can be solved. We cannot allow confusion or panic. And therefore, we must act. Therefore, we need active efforts on the part of every one of us. And this is possible. And this is why I am an optimist. Thank you. Any question you have been saving for President Gorbachev? Mr. President, uh, I have a comment and a question. The comment, I have just come back from Iraq. I can tell you that there are many Iraqis who are glad that the coalition is there. The question, there is... Well, you are lucky. Thank you. So are they. So are they. 
My question is very simple. You are a peacemaker. How would you resolve the problem in Chechnya? Um, I've had the same position, a very firm position on Chechnya uh, since 1994. By the way, I was born in the south of Russia, in Stavropol, in the Caucasus, and uh, that region borders on Chechnya. So I know the situation, I know it historically. When uh, Boris Yeltsin thought that he could improve his sagging popularity by a successful little war in Chechnya, I said that that uh, will be, would be a big mistake. And uh, I also uh, offered my mediation to avert that war. When the war started, I continued to uh, insist on a political solution to this problem. And despite the very difficult situation that President Putin inherited, uh, he too, I believe, wants a political solution to this problem, even though uh, some people are trying to push him toward a military solution, and particularly the fighters, the militant Chechen fighters, too, want the continuation of the war. It is my opinion that Putin will continue to prefer a political solution and that he will move along a political path. Uh, right now, the administration in that republic, both uh, at the Chechen, le both at the level of the Chechen Republic and at the local level, consists of ethnic Chechens. Uh, they are rebuilding the infrastructure, the communications, uh, the housing, uh, the medical system, the educational system. They are uh, recreating the economy that was destroyed and that is still largely destroyed. The most difficult problem is currently housing for the people. I believe that the adoption of the Chechen constitution and the elections that were held there, even though they were flawed, are a step in the right direction. My view is that Chechnya should continue to be an inalienable part of Russia, but it should receive a special status of autonomy. I believe that ultimately this political approach will bring peace to Chechnya and generally in the Caucasus, which is part of Russia. And of course, the Chechens themselves cannot uh, rebuild uh, alone, rebuild their country alone. And uh, the entire Russian Federation should contribute to the rebuilding of Chechnya. Thank you. And now we must have short questions and short answers. <laughs> I'll try to keep this as short as possible. President Gorbachev, I was wondering what each individual citizen could do in order to promote a more equitable world, in your opinion, of course. Well, I believe, first of all, we should all learn to be tolerant, respectful, 
of our neighbors, respectful of other countries and their people. We should respect their cultures, we should respect their history. Uh, let me say something in, in this regard about terrorism. I believe that we should speak about the underlying causes of uh, terrorism. Of course, those causes are things like uh, extremism, fundamentalism, religious fundamentalism, political fundamentalism, and of course the causes of terrorism also are in the problems of poverty and backwardness. But perhaps the first but perhaps today the primary cause of terrorism is that some people, some nations feel humiliated and this is something that feeds terrorism. So as citizens, we should prefer and vote for those political leaders who prefer dialogue instead of uh, force, who prefer cooperation and political solutions. Ronald Reagan called it the evil Soviet empire. And what I would like to have you react to is that during that last century, the 20th century, as violent as it was, somewhere between 100, possibly closer to 200 million people lost their lives due to communism. And the fact that more communists died at the hands of fellow communists than probably the actions of all other anti-communist organizations put together. Question. Question, Could you comment on this? Well, I started Perestroika in order to rid my country of the communist model that existed there. And when we started the process of glasnost democracy, political pluralism and free elections and free religion in our country. We also recognized that this is also the right of all the other countries that at that time were the members of the Warsaw Pact. We never intervened in, we never intervened in those processes. The, the, people of, um, the people of those uh, countries took their own decisions. They uh, decided how they want to live, what uh, kind of system they want to have, and what kind of alliances they want to have. So that probably should answer your question about my attitude. President Reagan. And President Reagan. President Reagan did call the Soviet Union an evil empire, but when we started the process of change, when our country began to change with Perestroika and Glasnost, he visited the Soviet Union in 1988 and he was uh, answering the question of a reporter in the Kremlin uh, with many people present and when he was asked whether he still believed that the Soviet Union was an evil empire, he said, I no longer think so. Yeah, <laughs> 
And I very much want for the American people to better understand us. Last summer, last summer I was on a speaking tour in this country and I said to Americans, you want us to have a country, a system that is as good as yours. Well, we want that too. We want even to do better. But we are dealing... But we are dealing with a country that had a thousand year history and of that we had 250 years of Mongol domination, 200 years of slavery, 70 years of the communist system, the communist monopoly. It is not easy after this kind of history to make a country that would be a successful modern democracy. So I said to Americans, it took you uh, 200 years to build the kind of democracy that you have today. Why do you want us to build a democracy in 200 days? Mikhail Sergeyevich, what is your view on the political situation in Russia now? Uh, do you share the view of most of the American politicians? Or do you see the situation as a necessary process to establish some kind of order and give people some break, which they need? And another question is, do you still think about organizing the Social Democratic Party in Russia and how realistic this idea is? Well, I, I, I not only still think about creating a Social Democratic Party in uh, Russia, I created that party and I am its leader. As regards the current situation in Russia, this is what I would say. President Putin inherited a very difficult situation, and we all inherited a very difficult situation after the Yeltsin period. During his first term, President Putin has been able to stabilize the situation, to strengthen the Federation. He has insisted that the regions of Russia, the constituent regions of Russia, follow the constitution of Russia. He has also improved the tax system and uh, improved the social situation, but that is just at the very beginning. People have faith in Putin despite the mistakes that he has made and uh, the shortcomings uh, of Putin. Nevertheless, he won the elections very convincingly. But right now, but right now, Putin and his government face a really crucial task: how to move Russia toward a modern democracy. And he should use. And he should use the second term to move in that direction. And from what he has been saying recently, I believe that this is exactly what he is going to do. I think this will not be easy. This will be difficult, and particularly initially, this may come at some cost, uh, at some social cost. But I believe that it could become a very, very powerful 
push forward for the historic development of Russia. And if he moves in this direction, I will give him my support. But if it is a different direction, then I will and my colleagues will have to rethink our position, which I think is quite normal in a democracy. Mr. President, I have a question about the energy crisis and global warming. Um, there, it's a controversial topic in our country, I know, um, the use of nuclear energy. But countries such as Japan and France have moved toward the direction of using more nuclear energy to create or to decrease the, the burning of fossil fuels. From your experience, how effective do you think um, nuclear energy would be in today's world? I believe it's very important now to do some fundamental research on new and renewable energy sources. I recently, I recently talked to some of our leading scientists and they seem to be optimistic that this is possible. But this is still a problem. This problem of new renewable sources of energy has not yet been solved. And therefore, in the foreseeable future, we will still be using nuclear energy. And therefore, it's extremely important to make it safe, to make it totally safe. And I am saying this while fully understanding my position as a person uh, who saw the Chernobyl catastrophe, the Chernobyl nuclear disaster, and also as the president, as the chairman of the board of Green Cross International. So this is my sincere and honest position. I cannot say that this is the final truth, but I believe that at this time, this is probably the only approach. And um, uh, finally, let me say that I believe it's very important to get rid of nuclear weapons and also to get rid of the nuclear industry in the form that it exists now. It's uh, an honor to be able to ask a question. When you initiated the processes of Glasnost and Perestroika, could you envision, could you have imagined that it would lead ultimately to the collapse of the Soviet Union, or did you think something very different would happen, that one would end up with a reformed Soviet Union? Was it clear? <laughs> Well, first of all, glasnost and freedom of speech were essential to perestroika. That's my first point. Secondly, the causes of the breakup of the Soviet Union were domestic, were in the way. The causes of that breakup were domestic and they uh, were lying in the conflict between uh, reform and the bureaucracy, the nomenclatura. The bureaucrats uh, saw that they could not win free elections and therefore they did not accept perestroika. 
the Soviet Union was over-centralized as a country and a state. Uh, at the same time, nominally, it was a federation. What we needed to do was to decentralize the Soviet Union. That could have prevented and averted the breakup. What we wanted to do is to give a chance uh, to take the initiative, both to give that chance to the citizens and also to the local government. Actually, this over-centralization was a big constraint on the country's development. On August the 20th, 1991, we were scheduled to sign a new treaty between our republics. That would have created a new kind of union, a decentralized union that could be viable. We Uh, we knew that this would be a new kind of country, a different kind of country, and um, uh, we believed that. And at the same time, the nomenclatura, the bureaucrats, they also understood that that would be a very different kind of union, a very different kind of country, that they would have to stand to run for election. They knew that they could not win a free election, and that's why they attempted a coup d'etat. They attempted uh, a coup against me. No, well, what happened happened, and there are no direct roads in history. <laughs> it also means that we, as reformers, sometimes acted too late. <laughs> While we speak harshly of the nomenclatura and of those who plotted the coup, at the same time we understand that we as reformers also made mistakes and we bear some of the responsibility for what happened. You have the last question. Okay, thank you. As as one of the few persons in history to... Well, this is what the organizers say, not what the president is saying. <laughs> As one of the few persons in history to voluntarily give up the leadership of a major world power, can you tell us how you came to do this? Uh, well, I behaved, in fact, like a Democrat. Yeah. <laughs> I had some other options available to me, but I could not take that road, that very dangerous road that could have resulted in bloodshed, that could have resulted in civil strife and conflict in our country, conflict and bloodshed that would have been very dangerous for our country, but also given that we had all those weapons, including weapons of mass destruction, would have been extremely dangerous to the world and could have resulted in a, in a world disaster. So that's my answer. That's why I just stepped down.
This is the time when we have set aside to give our award to uh, President Gorbachev, and I'd like to ask the members of the board of the Citizen Peace Building Program to come up, please. And I'd like to explain to you, President Gorbachev, the nature of our organization, which is dedicated to the study and the action of improving citizen initiatives for peace, for peaceful resolution of conflicts. And we're working in many parts of the world, studying and acting and trying to make it more effective. And, and we work here too, at home as well, locally and internationally. And my name is, I want to thank Paula Garb and our entire Citizen Peace Building Board for their hard work. My name is John Graham. I'm also on the C Citizen Peace Building Board. Uh, I have the privilege of saying thank you. First of all, I want to thank all of you for coming tonight and supporting peace. So thank you very much. I also want to thank all the folks who work so hard on putting this program together. Uh, a lot of the folks on the stage certainly did, but there are people all around that helped out, so thank you for that. And now, President Gorbachev, I have to thank you in a number of ways for a number of things. Uh, first is just coming here and bringing your daughter, Irina, coming all the way from Moscow, halfway around the world, to talk to us. I also want to say on behalf of all of us, thank you for an inspiring speech and particularly your optimism. We also need to thank you, as the Chancellor said, for your work as a political leader, in particular your courage for choosing peace. And your courage saved millions of people. And your courage changed the world as a political leader. So thank you. Tonight in particular we're honoring your work as a citizen, or still a political leader, but as a citizen. And uh, obviously Global Green and the Gorbachev Foundation are part of your work or represent your work. But the main thing we want to thank you for and give you an award for tonight is your dedication to building a safer world. And Gif Gifford, do you want to grab? Okay, now, for those of you who haven't seen this award, um, this is kind of an odd award. We're giving you pieces of guns. But Gifford, a professor of art, kind of a real character too. I didn't say odd, he said odd. Uh, but uh, he, he relished the assignment of taking weapons and creating something beautiful from them. And we think that's very consistent with what you're trying to do, destroying weapons and creating something beautiful. So Gifford, uh, we'd like to give you the, the inaugural Peace Award from the Citizen Peace Building Program, and from henceforward, it'll be called the Gorbachev Award. Spasiba. I need, to I need to also thank Sheriff Corona. Uh, we got the weapons confiscated from the Orange County Sheriff's Department. So thank you very much. I don't know if you'd like to say anything else. Uh, thank you. I have seen and did hear that there are the barrels here of small bore rifles, but also of a gun that's uh, a combat gun. It is a very important symbol. Let us, uh, um, instead of uh, swords, let's have plowshares.
Ручка из металла ракеты сделана. И еще сувениры именно из ракет, которые были уничтожены. Uh, among the souvenirs that I have is a pen and some other objects that were made from the metal of the missiles that were destroyed as a result of arms control agreements. So this will be added to that exhibition that we will exhibit in the Gorbachev Foundation. This is a very important symbol. Thank you.